so pleased to have with me Kat Edmondson, who is a singer, songwriter, you do it all. And I first found you because I loved your voice. It's very, very different. And you have an old soul, do you think? Absolutely. Now, you wrote your first uh, music when you were nine years old in a school bus at Houston. Tell me about that. I started writing as a little girl without even realizing that's what I was doing. You know, you get a song in your head, like you're humming or something, and and you don't know that you're doing it, and you just go about whatever you're doing, the dishes or, you know, walking the dog, and you're humming a song. Well, I was doing this, but I, at some point I realized I was not singing someone else's songs. I was writing my own. Um, it was an experience that was very much happening to me. And when I became privy to this, then I started manipulating it and playing games and trying to figure out, okay, so what words go within this music and what is it that I'm trying to express? So the first time I sat and wrote this song on a school bus, um, I, it was very natural. It wasn't an ambitious process. It was just passing the time. Is there anybody musical in your family? My mom is a wonderful singer, though she never pursued it. And my father, who I never had a relationship until my adulthood, um, was a drummer, um, kind of an amateur drummer, but uh -huh. a drummer no less. And my whole family loves music and a great appreciation for music. Now, when you found your genre, I was reading that you love Fred Astaire films. Uh -huh. Do you really feel like you were, are from the 1930s or 1940s or 1950s? I, I used to, and I used to feel very out of place um, in, in the modern setting. But the more that time passes, the more I understand that um, I'm, I'm very much of this time. It's just that I appreciate um, past decades and, and other eras um, very much. And, if anything, I'm bringing that sensibility forward. Now, you, you have your fourth album out, Old Fashioned Girl, mm -hmm. and the video is lovely. It's a gathering, a cocktail party, and you get up and you sing. Did that ever scare you to death to get up the first time you did in a club to sing, or were you so self-assured you were ready to go? I was not scared. In fact, I was quite ready. And I don't even remember the first time because I was always doing it. When you write a song, where does your inspiration come from? That life. I mean, if I'm happy, I'll, I'll be writing. If I'm sad, I'll be writing. If I'm frustrated, I'll be writing. I don't deliberately write most of the time. I just find myself writing, and that's when I sit down and um, follow the muse, if you will. You live in Brooklyn right now, mm -hmm. and you wrote some of these songs when you were holed up in your apartment in Brooklyn not feeling so well. Is I had that, a terrible is that true? cold that would not go away, and it lasted for weeks. It just kept forming into this new thing, and it was exactly the time that I had set aside to work on my new record, and I was incredibly frustrated, and I was sitting around in my bed just feeling awful and watching Turner Classic Movies, because what else do you do when you feel sick? <laughs> Get in bed and watch movies, right? And I was watching all these old films, and with every film that came on, I would turn it off and I would feel inspired and start writing. So I ended up being very productive with, with then you know, having this virus. <laughs> You were on American Idol, mm -hmm. the second season. Did mm -hmm. the judges get you? Did they get your voice? Did they understand who you were? Um, enough that I got very far in the, in the program, but um, not ultimately, no. They just didn't know where to put me. Did you have conversations with, who were the judges at that point? Simon, Randy, and Paula. And they said to you what? Uh, Simon thought I sounded like Doris Day. I would love that, actually. So did I. And Randy, um, he said I had a very different sounding voice. He told me I didn't look like a star dog, which was the quote. A which, star dog? Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> and, and you know, I really thought, if I'm on this show, aren't you supposed to make me look like a star? Wouldn't that be the easiest? 
part. I mean, who looks like one until they get all made up and... Of course. Um, and the third judge? Uh, Paula, she was encouraging. And she told, I, at the time, I, was, I sang Fever. That was one of the songs I did. And I was doing a sort of like jazzy dance. And she told me to lose the theatrics. But she was very sweet. And did you lose the theatrics, or did yeah, I stopped moving around so much? But now, in retrospect, I move around a lot, you know. So you take these things uh, with a grain of salt. Everyone's different. When you do a show, are you trying to take somebody on a journey with you? What are you trying to tell your audience when you're singing to them? First and foremost, I want to connect with them because I love sharing that really intimate space with them, and I love exploring the the sentiments of each song and, and taking them through, yeah, on a journey through each song because each song is like a story or a, or a mini play or something. I mean, you start with a beginning and then you move forward and then there's often a resolution or not. Um, so I, I really love for them to come along with me on that ride and and, and feel a gamut of things that I have to offer in the evening. My show is usually very intimate, not explosive, you know, not, it's, it's like not a smoke, no lights. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a cabaret, and that's how you connect. How would you describe your music, your voice? Do people have a hard time doing that? They often say um, that it sounds very sweet or they'll say that it sounds like a, a, a big old woman or they'll say um, that it sounds like Julie London or Blossom Deary or Eartha Kitt and what I think is really going on you know Simon Cowell said Doris Day I think people are choosing the the singers that they loved from from a particular era and and pinning that on me because I, most of the time I I don't sound like those people, but the comparisons are wonderful because they're clearly people that are beloved, well, and, and I'll take that. Kit, my gosh. She's great. And Julie London. Who do you think you sound like? Or are you just you? I'm me. I, I you know, I, I see the comparison with myself and Blossom Deary, who um, I had never heard before. Uh, someone came and said, you sound like her, and so I checked her out, and then I bought all of her records. And I, I, we have a, a similar timbre. But, um, no, I'm afraid I just sound like myself. <laughs> You're just too perfect. Now, have you had voice lessons, or is this just all self-trained? Only recently have I taken a couple of lessons, just to see how to use my facility and optimize it. But um, I actually was very shy about doing that early on, because I didn't want anyone to impede on what it is that I'd already developed. The latest album, Old Fashioned Girl, what are we going to hear on this? Love, longing, romance, um, there's harp, and there, there's a string orchestra, and uh, there's some very cheeky tunes, and there's some very deep, thoughtful, um, uh, nostalgic so <clears throat> songs, and then there's one very vulnerable tune, um, uh, all about have, being oneself, and, and the importance of doing that. It's, it, it really runs the gamut, but it's, um, I'd say, my version of a, of a 1950s musical. It's, it's c like the score to something Which like that. Which is music to my ears, because I feel like some, I was born in the 50s, so I feel like I, the 50s are uh, romantic to me, the 40s are romantic to me. I, have people called you a crooner at all? Do they describe you as such? They've suggested that at times, yeah. And you say what to that? Great. <laughs> the old standards, right? Yeah. Have you, ever, have you ever sung any Doris Day songs? Oh, I'm sure that I have. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of uh, her repertoire off the top of my head. Yes, I know that we've shared some of the same tunes. So Simon Cowell was kind of right. Yeah, I sure. I suppose. As, you, as your career goes forward, will you stay in your genre because that's who you are, or will you look to other things? Some of your songs are very ballad-like, some of them are up-tempo. You've got a wide range. It's true. Who's to say? I don't want to limit myself. I'm just going to go where my heart is, you know? But um, I imagine that I'll always somewhat sound the same because um, 
because I feel I know myself at this point. Now, I don't hear a southernness in your voice at all from Houston. Have you worked on changing your voice? No, I just never picked one up. I guess I didn't think it was necessary. <laughs> even as a child. I watched so many old movies as a kid and, and everyone's using like the neutral Midwestern accent in those films that maybe that's just where my ear went, but. Interesting. Now you've done some touring outside the United States as well. Mm -hmm. Drop some names of who you've toured with. Lyle Lovett, first and foremost, he, he took me on the road very early on. How did he find you? I was singing at a wine bar and his wife was there um, at a birthday party and and she took one of my CDs and gave it to him and he reached out and and uh, he's a he's a wonderful wonderful friend he's he's been so great did he give you your shot at, at sort of climbing up the ranks then I have to say that I'm pretty scrappy and I was already finding my way into a lot of channels at the time that we met but he gave me a major boost yes Chris Isaac you've toured with him mm -hmm. how was that great Chris yeah. is a doll he's just wonderful and I think every woman would love to hear that but he's as charming in person as he is on stage and um, perhaps more thoughtful than anyone knows Gary Clark jr. is someone else I've toured with Jamie Cullum um, I've opened for Willie Nelson and Smokey Robinson and George what Benson. What was that like opening for Smokey Robinson? Um, I, I was the most nervous. I, I don't tend to get very nervous, but I was incredibly nervous opening for him, like to the point of shaking because I've been such a fan for so long. I actually sang one of his songs in my set in tribute to him. Wow. Yeah. And what did he think? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know the I never to got to talk to him afterward. So you think of yourself as a jazz singer? Mostly? Mostly. But there's there are elements of what I do that aren't jazz and I don't know what to call that. But yes, I mean that's that's my foundation. As a songwriter, who do you want to collaborate with that you have not done? If I could sing with Tony Bennett, <gasps> I would love that. That's your era, right? That's my dream, and I, I would love it. You know, he's singing with all these young women, and I would love to be one of them. Well, Kat, you said you're scrappy. It's true. So you, you've got it, and you live in Brooklyn. Look, it's not like I haven't tried. <laughs> We're just, I'm still working on it. <laughs> you're very young. There's still time to go. All right, so the song you're going to sing for us mm -hmm. is what, and, and how, did you, how did you write it? It's How's About It, Baby, and I wrote it like I said, lying in my bed with a cold um, after watching a bunch of 1930s movies. It's about two people meeting in a park, two people that know each other ha ha happening upon one another in the park. And it's written from the perspective of, the, of a male character trying to woo her to stay in the park with him. On, on a date, even though he has no money to take her out. He wants to show her a good time in the park. Incidentally, when I wrote this new album, um, I wrote it as, as a script, uh, uh, an outline for a screenplay, for a musical, um, to accompany it. And, and you know, I, I, it's not in development at this point, but. It should be. I'm working on that, too. Oh, that's good. You'll have to come back and tell us all about it. Okay. Kat Edmondson, thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing this song. Thank you.